Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. And then we're ready to rejoice and be glad. Parents, final weekend with the children. The children will be going back to school. Yay. Kids are saying yay. <laughs> Appreciate you all being here today. Appreciate the Lord. We're ready to worship Him and magnify Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and bless you in this house. We magnify you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift our hands and our hearts to you, O God. Father, we thank you.
I've been asked a million times, how do you do it? Praise and thanksgiving. Yeah.
every school teacher, yeah. every school worker, yeah. I want you to come. Come quickly. Neil, Mr. Neil, come on. Get on down there because that's all we here today. Neil, uh, help me. I want, I want the children in behind them if you would. Okay, so every child in this building, if you just, if you all will face us this way, just face this way, we're going to have Pastor pray. Kids, get right behind them so you can lay hands on them. Okay, Mr. Neil, if you don't care, scoot over. All right, kids, get close enough that you can lay hands on their back. Okay? All right? Just all the kids. All right, come on in. Help them there, Miss Joyce. Come on, Daniel. And then we're going to pray for the children. If you want to come, come quickly. Come quickly.
to do the tricks on me there a minute ago. So. Praise God. Oh, we might as well take her um, It is difficult for me to put into words the um, the cry of my heart for the next generation and the generations to come. And uh, I just pray and trust that God will enlarge your heart if he hasn't already and put uh, a real desire of prayer and supplication for all that is in front of them to navigate, praise the Lord. And uh, I'm just I'm incredibly grateful and thankful to be part of a kingdom I'm going to put it in my words that ain't going anywhere. Now, King James says it cannot be moved, but I'm going to tell you, it ain't going anywhere. God said his kingdom here to be here, right? And he's planning on ruling over all, and so that's a uh, beautiful thing, and I, I'm grateful for that. So uh, I'm so very thankful and so grateful, and I know that there's that might raise a few questions for some of you, and I hope it doesn't take the wind out of your sails, but... But uh, I am grateful that God has a plan for this place. He has a plan for Praise Cathedral. He has a plan for Jackson County. He has a plan for this state. He has a plan for this nation. He has a plan for all nations. And I am just, I'm grateful that, uh, that God is uh, so good and so patient. And I believe that it's, more than high time that we learn how to relay and convey and speak and declare and proclaim the plan and purpose of God and to do it in a way that is uh, that empowers the next generation that empowers the generations to come I think sometimes we have uh, we have leaned into some what I would deem to be a bit unhealthy uh, attitudes and ideas that that have, that have made us less concerned about the future for our children and our grandchildren. Because I want to say this, I believe the gospel is about more than just people going to heaven when they die. I believe in that. Please, don't misunderstand me. Don't say, well, pastor don't believe in heaven, because pastor certainly does. And he, but I believe there's more to this. I believe that it's not, that's not the entirety of the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Jesus came. He didn't say, I, I came that you might go to heaven when you die. I came that you might have life. And that you might have it more abundantly. If you have that life, you will go, you will go to heaven when you, when you pass this, when you pass off of this, this, uh, this plane of this existence. And so uh, anyway, I'm. I'm kind of a little bit off kilter there with that, perhaps, but uh, I, I want to share some things to you that, with you today. See if I can get my mouth a little bit under control here. Uh, but I want to talk about a paradise walk today. What I want to do, and I this particular phrase and this particular uh, this particular thought has been rumbling around probably in my head off and on and in my heart off and on for probably months now and it's like I see some stuff and I grab it and I think Lord can I go with it something else shows up and so I so I'm thinking well, maybe it's not that important but I but if this started really settling on me with what I believe to be some clarity and so I want to share some of that with you today and uh, because I think sometimes we have, we have, uh, we, we just have had some incomplete ideas about some stuff. And so I hesitate to say we've been wrong about things and that, that's pretty easy for people to say. And I don't believe that in, in that sense. 
I believe that we haven't followed through perhaps in, in, the, in our manner of thinking. I believe that perhaps we haven't thought about this, what this means if we follow the thought on out and we extend it beyond just this particular statement. But I want to talk about the paradise walk today. And then so, uh, so I want to start where you would expect us to start, which is in Genesis chapter 3 uh, and verse 8. So Gabe, if you'll go ahead and put that up. Uh, I, I, I want to, it's, it's fascinating to me that the scripture starts with the creation of the world and man being in a garden and this being Eden, the delightful land, the delightsome land. It is, a, it is what we call the paradise of God, right? And it is that relationship between God and man, between the divine and the human, however you want to say it. Between the highest and, and, and between the highest of heaven and the highest on earth, I'm going to say it to you that way, because I know that you know too many Disney movies kind of makes us think higher of critters, perhaps than than uh, you know than. And I'm not saying that you should disrespect them, but I think sometimes we think a little highly of them uh, than, than perhaps we should. We need to remember. But the last thing, God created everything, and the last thing he did was man. The last thing, the, the thing that he put his form in, that he gave his image to, the thing that he made to be most like him, okay? And so it's, it's an interesting idea to me that the book starts with such a place, and then when you get to Revelation 22, you find that we, we see that place once again in the book. So is it, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and I know there's some exotic ideas out there. I had a conversation with some folks some years ago that they believed uh, that probably would be the only folk I know of that would be excited about global warming because they think the planet's going to return to a tropical paradise. And, you know, I, I'm not going to throw anybody on the bus and talk about that other than that. I, I don't necessarily believe that. Because I believe that what, what the scripture is talking about is the kingdom of God and the relationship, the redeemed life that Jesus came to bring and to initiate and to establish in the world. And so anyway, it says that we're looking at this after they've eaten the fig. See, I caught myself almost said the apple there. Anyway. We've caught, we've caught this after they, after they have eaten of the tree. I'll be saying it that way. Uh, uh, and, and so what I want to do is I want to walk us through just the first part, the, the first part of this verse. Right? It says, and they, they, so not just he or not just she, but because they were together, because they were a unit, because they were United because they were a pair, because they walked side by side and they were connected, right? It was this, this uh, that, that, that the woman was out, brought out of the man and she would return, uh, you know, a woman came from man and, and, and but yet man will come from her, right? There's this, there's this interchangeable facet to this. That is, that is physical and spiritual and all of these things. And it's kind of difficult sometimes for, uh, you know, for us to follow through on. And that's not my focus. But I do want you to realize that they heard something. That they heard the voice. Now, when it says they heard, the Hebrew word for heard means to hear intelligently. Now, at about 4.30 this morning, I heard something too. It was a powerful clap of thunder that was louder than my CPAP that caused me to open my eyes and then I saw the, 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 the light and sound display. Usually, I can, if it's not severe or not right over the house, and I can, I, you know, it doesn't tend to wake me up. But for whatever reason, last night I heard a sound that it took me a minute to figure out what it was. Now, when the scripture here says they heard, it means to hear intelligently. 
That doesn't mean cerebrally or intellectually. It means that they heard it and they understood what it was. It also means attentively. So it was a sound they had been paying attention to. Now catch this. Even though they had fallen, even though they had been, they had disobeyed, uh, you know, the, the only commandment that they had, they disobeyed that. They kind of, uh, you know, that they, they transgressed. They, uh, you know, they fell or however you want to say it. There's a lot of ways to do it. And I don't want to get tangled up in all that today. But even though they had fallen, they still were able to hear something from heaven with clarity. They heard it with distinction. They heard it intelligently. And the word obey is, you know, when you look at the word obey in throughout the, the, the course of scripture, it means to hear intelligently. It means that they hear it in a way that they understand it. Because if you hear things you don't understand... You don't know how to respond to it, right? You don't know how to react to it. You can react to body language, hand gestures, uh, facial expressions. You can, you can react to a lot of those kind of things, and fair enough, that's all part and parcel of communication. But if we don't understand what is being said, then we cannot enter into the kind of relationship or agreement with it that we, that, or, or even to reject the counsel of it unless we understand it. If it's something that we realize that, hey, I don't flow with that, then, then we understand it. We still hear it intelligently. It's just not something that's part of us at this point, right? Anyway, but they heard intelligently and they heard attentively because they had spent time with this sound. Now it says the voice of the Lord. And, and this is a real, this is a real uh, interesting choice of words here. Because I don't know if you've ever given any thought to how a voice can walk. How sound travels, so to speak. Whether you've given a whole lot of consideration to that, whether you thought about this and you know I mean we have devices that can measure that and we measure distance we you know we can you know the speed of it and the you know and the sound and how far it travels and how long it takes this stuff to get here and there and, you know in the modern world we have uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, scientific data that helps explain some some stuff similar to this but none of this none of that matters to this okay because what they are what they are what they are hearing, the word voice here means sound or noise. So when God shows up in the garden, he sounds a certain way. There is a particular sound. If you remember and you think about the, even when they, you get over into the, uh, into the tabernacle of Moses and they start making the trumpets and they start to say the trumpets make a certain sound. They have to be able to call you to worship or call you to warfare. And so you have to, happy are the people who know the joyful sound, the psalmist says. They have to be able to distinguish, to hear intelligently, and be able to identify the differences in the sound of the trumpet. Because the trumpet's going to either call, it'd be too bad to show up to temple with your, with your shield, your sword, and all your battle armor on. You show up to the field when it's the call to temple, or you go to the temple when it's the call to battle in the field, right? So you're kind of missing something in the translation. That means you're not hearing it intelligently. So what had happened, for however long this, this is, and however long this has been going on, it was, it was part and parcel of paradise. That when God's voice, when the sound of God in the garden was heard by them, they understood it to be him. They understood it to be his presence, his glory, his holiness, his majesty. And they understood it to be that. That's why they hid from it, right? Because they weren't those things anymore. They had stepped back, if you will. They had, 
They, they, they had discovered their own nakedness and they had walked with him. Uh, you know, uh, it, would be, it would be complete conjecture to try to estimate how long they heard and, and recognized the sound, how long it had been and how often they had, had walked with him. And so, but, but they, they heard the voice. They heard intelligently the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Now, think about this for a minute. Think about the number of places, as let's just throw Joshua in here, for example, that when he got counsel from, from the angel of the Lord, he says, when you hear a sound, when you hear a noise, when you hear the sound of marching in the mulberry trees, that's when you know. That's when you know it's time to move forward. When you hear, because you see, there's something about when God moves, there's a sound to it, all right? There's something about it that should resonate with you and I. And it doesn't really, you know, I mean, it should, it should echo and reverberate in the depths of our heart. Whether we are in fellowship or out of fellowship, we should be able to identify his presence. Now, it's much better in fellowship, I'll say that, because if you're in fellowship, you don't go high. Anyway, but they heard the voice of the Lord God walking, and it is the Hebrew word halak, which is the word that has morphed into or that that is the base word or the primary word for the Hebrew term halakha. Now, you say, what is that? Halakha means, means it, it is the, it's a, a Jewish term that means the entirety of revealed truth and the, the manner of life expressed, it's the path to that. It's the way we walk in relationship to all that we, all that the Torah or the law has revealed about about God and the life that that law it, it, it is to provide for us if we keep it, right? That's what, in, in its basic form, that's what halakha is. It is, a, it is the Jewish way of life via the commandments and the path they choose to walk. So when Jesus in John 14 says to his disciples, I'm the way, I'm the path, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, he said, the Messiah has come, I've come to show you a new halakha. I've come to bring you into a new way to live and a new way to respond, into a new life, a new pattern of existence. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Because every element of this is him. He's the truth. He's the revealed body of truth. He is the express image of the invisible God. He is the, he is the full incarnation of deity. He is all that the Father would ever reveal himself to be to the world. And so there is this full revelation of what God is saying and how he presents himself. And then it is the life that he gives to you and I in the process. And now he shows us the way, hallelujah, the path of life, right? The way to travel, the way to live forward, the way to live best, the way to live abundantly, the way to live freely. So all of this, this is all part and parcel, if you will, of the walk, what I'm calling the walk of paradise. And so he, you know, it means to walk along a pace or be conversant. So it's not just a walking buddy. Think, the, think about the road to Emmaus. What happened on that road? They walked together. Two guys walked together. They were alongside and they were a pace. But they were sad, right? They were distraught. They were disillusioned. They were down. They were disquieted. There were all of these, all of the, you know, they just didn't understand what was going on. And so what happens is, is along the road to Emmaus, somebody shows up, right? And starts walking along with them. Starts walking alongside them. And in the course of this conversation, he begins to unlock and open the scripture to them. Yeah. And so what happens is, is they start to be zealously affected by the word. Yeah. Their heart. 
hearts begin to burn within them. And, and there's something about this guy's company and this conversation and this this uh, this traveling, this this uh, this uh, uh, enjoined path forward, if you will. And, and until they reach their destination, and I, I love you, just gotta appreciate the fact that. God will push our boundaries and our buttons sometimes. I love how that's worded in Luke's gospel. They reach their destination and he, how Luke says, and he made as though, he made as though he would walk farther. God pretended like. He kind of gave them the impression, right, that he was going to, that he was going further. And they, because of their conversation, because of that fellowship, because of that, that powerful interaction and that, that discourse that they shared along the way, they were, uh, I, I won't say they were completely healed at that point or they'd gotten over anything, but there was sad in it. There was a balm in it. There was healing in it. There was, there was leaves and, and, and medicine, if you will, in the words of, their, uh, of, the, of the stranger that began to travel with them and began to talk to them and speak to them about Messiah and about his plan and about the purpose and about the, about the mission of him by, by the scripture. And so when they say to him, come and, you know, you may as well stay here. In other words, we don't want the conversation to end. Even though we're done walking, literally, we want to continue to walk conversationally. We want to continue the conversation. And so when they come in, as, a, as the, the dictates of hospitality, uh, you know, and the decorum of hospitality would dictate, I should say it that way. Uh, they, they offer him bread and he takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and their eyes are open. They recognize him, right? Now all the disillusionment begins to wash off of them. All of the doubt, all of the, all of the, uh, the fear, all of the uncertainty, everything begins to wash over them. They begin to be refreshed and renewed. They begin to have an experience that, that changes them. In fact, it so enlivens them and it so refreshes them that they turn around and they run back or walk back that plain old seven and a half miles. Because they have to go back and tell their brotherhood. They have to go back and tell all of those who might be in the same state of mind they're in that he's risen. They heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. And I love that. The garden is a, simply means a garden, but it means a fenced one. Praise the Lord. It's a fenced garden. That means it's protected. It's secure. It has a border, right, and a perimeter that's well established. If a garden is fenced, you know, you, you might have something that can get over the fence or under the fence, but, you know, you've done what you can to protect it. And so this garden is... This thing that, that where God put Adam was a, he had it, he had a fence around it. This was sacred to him. It was special to him. It was a, it was a, it was holy ground, if you will. It was sacred and should be kept protected. Now, and no matter how well, no matter how good a fence you build, there's a snake can get in there somehow, right? I don't, want to, I don't want to deal too much with that today. But, you know, the serpent was in the garden. Either maybe it was already there and he built a fence around him or whatever. We, we won't get into all that today. But what I'm after here is, is that the garden is designed to be safe. It's designed to be protected. It's designed to have some order and boundary. Boundaries are healthy, right? Boundaries can be healthy things. And you can live freely sometimes even in the course of a, of, of a border or a property line. And you should live as freely as you can in those instances. Anyway, but they walking in the garden, in a fenced garden, 
in a garden that is protected, that doesn't just let anybody in. I love that. In the cool of the day. Now, I, you know, I mean, when I first started in this, people said, well, you know, it was the evening or early in the morning. And, and, and you know, you can, depending on the time of year it is, you can find coolness in both of those things. But the Hebrew word for cool is ruach. And it means spirit, it means breath, it means wind. So in the spirit of the day, see, I believe that God walks with man in the spirit of the day. In the, in, in the breath, in the life that he has, that he has chosen and selected to, uh, to engage mankind in. And I believe that life is in his son. Yeah. Now, where we're going with this is that it is this, you know, in, in, uh, you know, when it says the spirit of God hovered or brooded or moved upon the face of the deep, it's the word ruach. And it means that he hovered, he fluttered, he, he, he breathed. It was, this, it was this majestic work of the Holy Spirit to bring and soften the chaos of, the, uh, of an unformed world and a, and, and a massive confusion and, 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 and uncertainty. And as that Spirit of God moved upon us through the idea of softening it, what it did was it made it prepped, it made it soft, and, and it gave it the ability to receive a creative word that would cause it to form, that would allow it to respond properly to the word of God. When God spoke, it would then allow the earth to receive the instruction of God and be formed and start to take shape and start to become ordered, start to be arranged, if you will. So it's the same word. And so so this is powerful to me because God wants to walk with us in a, in, in a garden that he, has, that he has enclosed. And he wants to, when we hear the sound of him and the sound of his voice and the, and the recognition of his presence, it is for you and I to be able to have fellowship with him by the Holy Spirit. Because that's the day that we're walking in now. Hallelujah. God's word says he will make you a garden and you make you a garden in a delightsome land. That means that what he has here in this picture is something that he wants to work in your life and my life. Let's go to 1 John 1 and 7. And again, I'm not I'm finishing that, but the cool of the day. John says this. As we're talking about God walking and we're talking about See, before Adam withheld himself from the presence of God, when God moved and walked, Adam and Eve moved and walked with him. They recognized and entered into, they agreed with, they, they flowed with, they, they responded correctly and properly and, 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 and graciously to what, to God's presence and his direction and his conversation along the way, right? It was probably on a walk like that that he said, I'd really rather you not eat from this particular tree. Yeah. It was probably during one of those walks in the spirit of the day that, they, that he understood this, that Adam understood this. Now, John says this, but if we walk in the light, so can I, su can I suggest to you that when Adam and Eve, prior to eating from the, from the tree of corruption, that, it, that, that they were walking in the light of God's counsel, that they walked in the illumination of his presence, that they walked in the, in the favor, if you will, or the, or the smile of his countenance. Can I, can, can, can I say those things and you can say, yeah, I can see that. So when Jesus comes and he breaks the curse and he becomes a curse for us and he, and he destroys the, uh, the works of the devil according to Hebrews chapter 2 and he sets right the world and he reconciles man from his sinful state to where we would hide in the trees and cover ourselves with our best effort and it would still fall short when he would bring us to a place where his sacrifice clothes us and restores our innocence. It restores our dignity. It restores our holiness. It restores everything God created us to be. See, 
John's grasped this and he says, but if we walk in the light, what kind of light? Well, not 40 watt, not 60 watt or 100 watt. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. He who alone dwelleth in the brightness that no man hath seen or can see, right? So this is, this is, you can't measure it in wattage, folks. You can't, you can't put a, you can't put an illumines number on it. You can't put those kind of, those kind of measurements are going to fall uh, uh, as inconsequential to, to the light and the glory in which he dwells. And he says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we respond, if we hear him and we move into his walk and we walk with him and we once again stand in a place where we can walk in relationship, in right relationship and in right spirit and in a right attitude, hallelujah, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, David said in Psalm 51. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Then will sinners be converted unto thee. This is the thing. God is changing and shifting and moving us into positioning us to be able to communicate his glory. To communicate his life. To communicate his blessing. To say to the world, there's salvation in Jesus. Hallelujah. All you've got to do is believe. All you have to do is receive. Hallelujah, with meekness, a, a, a word that he will engraft into you and it will save your soul, James said. Hallelujah. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, what's the result of hearing that and walking in that? We have fellowship one with another. As many of us as are walking, we have harmony. We have a shared, a shared Experience. We have a, a shared glory, if you will, a shared peace. Hallelujah, the kind of joy and the kind of gladness and the kind of, of benefit that comes from knowing him. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, or uh, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You and I have sin cleansed and eradicated. Sin's not our problem anymore. It's all because there's been a walk, a paradise that Jesus came to restore. And so some of that I want to talk about today. We're called children of light. In Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, we're not going to go there. It's not on my list. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5, he says, and, and I think in Ephesians it says to, we are to walk as children of light. And see, we just covered walking in the light as he is in the light. So walk as children of light. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5 says, You are children of the light and children of the day. Light and day go together. So in Genesis, we had the, the, the terminology of, of uh, the cool of the day. Walking in the cool of the day, Right? We're children of the day. What day is it? The day of salvation, the day of redemption, the day when God says, I'm, I, I've got your sin problem covered. I've got you. I'm bringing you into right relationship with me. I'm restoring you. You are being restored to fellowship. You're being reconciled unto God by the offering of Christ. You are brought into a, 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 a mindset of being refreshed and having the power and the ability and the privilege and purpose and right. To be able to walk with him among men. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I love that. Children of the day. Children of the light. Jesus said, I think it's in John 12. He says, uh, you know, that he's the light of the world. He that cometh after me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So there's this, there's this. This blending, if you will, of, of, of Jesus pulling together some of these some of these abstract ideas, and He pulls them together in Himself, which He was so very so very adept at doing, uh, because He was the fullness of all things, right? And so, so I started thinking about this, and so 
every time that you get in the Gospels and you start to read when he says to Peter and John and James and uh, Andrew, he says to those guys, follow me. It is, in one sense, the sound of his voice walking into the world. And where, how do we respond to that? Do we leave our nets and follow? And if we do, if we do, then we, then we find ourselves in walking with him, having fellowship with him and with one another. We start to discover that there is a walk and a way of life and a manner of living that, that brings fullness, that brings peace, that brings the, the, re, the realization of blessing and favor into our life. That's paradise, folks. That's how paradise works. It's the presence of God with men being walked in, and, and in conversation and flowing. And Jesus says to that every time you hear that and read that, think about that. And think about what that means to you. Because at some point when you heard about his voice... And you heard the phrase, follow me. If you're a believer, you responded to that. You, you heard the sound of his voice and you quit hiding in the bushes and you stepped forward. And your shame and your nakedness he covered and he, and he took away from you and he restored you to a place of life, to a place of peace, to a place of fellowship. I know in my life that's very true. And I'm grateful for it. Hallelujah. So every time we hear that, every time a sinner hears that and is converted and dares to believe that what Jesus said was not just a historical story, but it pierces and comes into relevance in the moment. And they realize that they've been, they've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything. And when he shows up next to your boat and says, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for men. I'll show you how to catch men. Then you have a decision to make. And when you make that decision for him and you leave your boat, doesn't mean you won't go back and use it at some point, but it does mean that you had a shift in the way you pursue your life. And you're walking differently now. It's a different emphasis, a different structure, a different purpose. There's newness to it. There's life in it. There's, there's fresh vision. There's, there's uh, you know, fresh bread in it and fresh uh, you know, it's it's the it's there's a wellspring of life and grace that flows and, and rises up. So every time we respond to that, we respond to the spirit of this day that we're in, because Jesus is still walking in the spirit of the day. He's still walking in the reality of his saving grace. He still stands at the ready in, in, with invitation, with hands outstretched, saying to the world, "Come unto me." All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest under your soul. He's inviting you and I to walk differently. He's inviting you and I to, to be restored to a garden. Hallelujah. A lifestyle that is blessed. A lifestyle and a life that is highly favored and divinely given and orchestrated and, and led and and he would guide us for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. The Scripture says they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. So he calls us to walk with him in newness, in dimension to dimensions of life, into a new day. And in my estimation, folks, this is, this is, that's an expression of paradise. I'm not trying to, again, I'm not trying to take heaven away from you. I'm not trying to minimize that. But I am trying to get us to see, get us into a life, get us into a way of living that honors heaven constantly, that is born of heaven. See, it's, it's okay to want to go to heaven, but it's also okay uh, to bring heaven here. Hallelujah. Say, so why is it but thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? In earth. As it is where? In heaven. Right? So what, there's, a, there's a, a, a divine mandate, if you will, for us to find that life of his and live in a manner that expresses that, in a manner that is true and in harmony and agreement with it, that, that, uh, that enables 
us to live well and to live forward and to and to uh, express clearly the goodness and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. So let's go one more place today and I'm about ready to close up shop here. Matthew 11, I've already quoted part of it or most of it in King James, but I want to take this into the, I want to read this out of the Message Bible. There's some, just some marvelous things in here that fit, that are, that complement what we've been talking about. And abruptly, we're at verse 25, abruptly Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth. So probably if this were written by a more traditional Jewish person, he would say, I thank you, Father, King of the universe, right? But it's, but it's translated Lord of heaven and earth. It's the same, the same basic dynamic, right? Anyway, but he says, you concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. So Jesus offers a prayer of thanks to his Father, who's Lord of heaven and earth, and he says to, he's, he thanks him for what he is making real and quickening and revealing to regular folk. See, the, the thing that frustrated the religious order of in the first century was that he wasn't highly educated enough for them and they had not had control over his education. They hadn't been able to steer him, guide him, and the common folk, the scripture says, the common folk heard him gladly, right? Yeah. And so, but, uh, you know, that was, they couldn't control the masses and they could only shake their head in pity because the masses were so undereducated and so foolish and so easily, uh, so easily, uh, you know, uh, fooled and, and, and led astray. And, and, but they didn't know how to deal with him because he wasn't the fool they thought he was. God came for regular folk. If you're regular folk, then he came for you. If you're, you know, if you view yourself as being a little bit more than regular folk, then you might have a little harder time finding me. But it still doesn't mean you're left out. Let's go to the next verse, please. He says, yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. God making, taking the ordinary, taking the, the regular, taking what others might overlook. See, that's the beauty of God is that he, he, you find him in the smallest things. There's a, there's a, a, a quote, I think it's, uh, well, I've heard, I've heard that alone, so I'm not, I, won't, I won't do that. But uh, anyway, just the, the realization that you can find him in you know, in, in, in a bottle of water. You can find him. How, how do I mean that? I mean, he's a, he's a cool drink on a hot day. Jesus is a thirst quencher. You can find him in the, in a, on a piece of paper. You, want to, you know, equate it to the heart. He wants to write in the, in the instrument that you would use, pencil or pen. You know, let, you know it, that he would write on the fleshly tables of our heart. That he would communicate with us in certain ways. And so we can find him in, in many of these, these ordinary things that so often get overlooked. But Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. See, he's given these, this follows on the heels of him making the pronouncement of woe to Bethsaida and Corazon, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what he does is he starts, he shifts gears, and this thing starts to turn dramatically. He resumes talking to the people, but now tenderly. He's not, he's not putting out a, a, a warning and a, uh, a you know, a, a proclamation of, of doom, if you will. He said, the Father has given me all these things to do and say, this is a unique father-son operation. And if there's anything we can say about the life of Jesus, it is that it was a unique father and son operation, right? The things that Jesus did, and he, he said that I do those things that I see my father do. And nobody else was doing those things. That's why they were astonished at his doctrine, because he taught as one that had power. 
He had, he had favor. He had the recognition of God and the hand of God upon his life to, to communicate. And when he communicated, he communicated in a way that, that physical things happened. The miraculous happened to punctuate his communication. And, and no story tells that better than the paralyzed man that they tear the roof off of. Right. But when they tear the roof off of that place to drop him down in because they can't get him through the door. There's too many people. He's got a crowd. He's probably got the street blocked off. He's probably, got, you know, it's the traffic's impeded. And now granted, it, you know, foot traffic can still flow to some degree, but but there's there's this quite this collection of people, but they couldn't get this man through the door to him, so they had to go up. They had to get creative. Sometimes you got to get creative to get people in the presence of God. So I want to tell you when you when you're praying and you're trying to trying to move people or trying to see if you can you can find your way into the presence of God, and it seems like everything is in your way, and there's so many obstacles and so much. So much, so many things to do that kind of that kind of just prevent the way forward. You, you need to get creative. You need to find a way around and find a way through. Find a way up and over and tear the roof off if you got to. But get what's broken. Get what needs his touch down into his presence. And when they dropped him in there, and I don't mean dropped as in let him free fall, but they lowered him into his presence. When they, when they lowered him into his presence, what happened was he said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And all the religious leaders that were in the crowd, whether they were in the room or leaning in or just standing at the door or the window or whatever, it was a blasphemous statement from their vantage point. Nobody but God can forgive sins. Who does this guy think he is? But he says, so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So that you know I'm not just blowing smoke. So that you know I'm not just, I'm not just pretending here. What I want you to see is, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk. Okay. We'll do it the hard way. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And when that guy rose and took up his bed, what that said to them was, yeah, I really did forgive his sins. No wonder it set everybody on their ear. No wonder it, it put them in orbit. No wonder that they were clear to launch, right? Because they were out, they, he was way outside of everything they had defined and secured and the perimeters they had built for things. Jesus jumped the fence on them. And now because he had illustrated that forgiveness in such a powerful, dynamic way, everybody was astonished. Even those that were against him, they didn't know how to react to him, didn't know how to, how to try to get him back in, the, pull back in his place, right? It was a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. So there's this, this relationship, father and son. By the way, Adam's also called the son of God, right? The book of Genesis and even in the book of Matthew, when he traces the, the genealogy all the way back to Adam, I believe there that he calls him the son of God too. Anyway, so this father-son thing. So there's something about the way Jesus walked and the way he related and the way he, the way he functioned in the presence of the father. There's something familiar about that because he always walked in the spirit of what the father was saying, right? He was in it and he was showing it. He was putting it on display, not just so we could marvel, not just so we could say, wow, that's really cool. And, and, you know, boy, that, well, that's something else. He didn't come just to impress us. He came to draw us in. He came to win us into and include us into that life. Let's read on. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. 
I'm willing to go over it line by I'll take my time and teach it. I want to take my time and make sure you get it. And I'm not looking to I'm not looking to uh, keep this to myself. I want in, I want to bring you in. I want to include you. I want you to realize that this walk, this thing that God's doing in redemption is done not just to, so you can be forgiven and, and just hang out. It's done so that you will learn how to walk and have fellowship and have a relationship with God yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. If you're willing to listen, what was it? They heard the voice of the Lord. That means they were listening from the sound. So I want to encourage you to listen. I want to encourage you to pay attention. I want to encourage you when you read the scripture, when you, when you spend your time in prayer, when you open your heart in the presence of God, however that is that you will listen. You will be attentive. You will be uh, uh, able to receive instruction and able to able to be affected powerfully by the presence of God. Yeah. By the, not just the idea of Him, the reality of Him in your life. Yeah. Next verse, please. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion. Hallelujah. Think about this for a minute. Now think about the context in which he's speaking. He's talking to folks that are, that, that are struggling. They're, and he's speaking to people who have had a yoke put upon them by tradition and by custom and by the, by the social, by the religious structure of the day. Remember in another place, he tells the Pharisees and the scribes, he says, you bind heavy burdens on those that you wouldn't lift a finger to help. Yeah. And he said, you do this with impunity. You do it just so you can watch people struggle. You do it not really to benefit them. You do it just so you can keep them under your thumb and keep them, keep your control, your sense of control. What Jesus did was he caused crowd control to be a problem. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? I love this next phrase, come to me. Every other time Jesus speaks, it's come after me. Follow me. So there's this idea of traveling, walking with him that, that's kind of the very focus of what we're talking about today. But in this sense, in this sense, he just says, you, got, you need to come to me. You need to come to me. You need to just come to where I am. Hallelujah. And when you come to where he is, and you are changed and affected by all that he is, then you are a child of light. You are a child of the day. And you will not walk in darkness. Hallelujah. And you will, you will have fellowship one with another. And you will have a relationship with your Savior and that will that will instruct you that will bring you line by line upon how to walk how to function how to how to uh, uh, live forward in in this in this era of salvation that puts us in a position that is like paradise are you tired worn out burned out on religion come to me Get away with me. So that speaks of traveling, right? Get away with me. Come with me. Walk with me. And you'll recover your life, right? Hallelujah. Now, let me ask you this. How do you recover? What's he talking about? Because most folk who are sinners don't know that they have a life. And so it's not that they're recovering something they lost. They were recovering something that was lost on their behalf, right? What they're recovering is the life that Adam fumbled at in the garden, the life that he forsook, the life that he couldn't bring himself to pursue any longer because he had transgressed and he had been disobedient and he had he, he perceived himself to be separated. He perceived himself to be unholy and God holy. And so Jesus came to restore that image and likeness that Adam had forfeited and fumbled. I'll say it to you that way because it's almost football season. And he says, get away with me and I'll teach you how to recover your life. I want to, see, the life God has for us is one that, that's 
greater. It's better. Hallelujah. Because he brought us even into a better covenant, right? Because the old covenant, the first covenant was faulty. He found fault with it. And it could never restore us to the kind of life and the kind of relationship because it was always about performance. It was always about, it was always about what we could do. And there were so many of them, what we had to do, what we shouldn't do. And there were so many of them. 613, to be precise, according to, according to uh, Orthodox Judaism, there's 613 commandments that, you were, that they were re required to keep. And so it's no wonder that in Paul's writings, he's, you know, that he said, you're going to offend one of them somewhere. And when you offend one of these laws, one of these commandments, then you're guilty of the whole thing. So what God does is he introduces us to an idea of grace. He introduces us to an idea about being justified by faith. Hallelujah. And finding our way by belief and by trust and by, by an experience that converts and, born, and we are born again by his goodness and his mercy. And in that new birth, we now are free to walk. We are now free to recover a life that we didn't know existed. I'm going to tell you the flat out truth. When I started this, I didn't have any idea the life that was in front of me. Jackie and I talk about this quite often. I had no idea life could be this good. I, I had no idea. So, you know, I've said this recently. When I first started, I started under the, under the notion excuse me, that God takes care of fools and idiots, and I have lived in both of those camps. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm thankful to not be in those camps. I still pass through from time to time, but I don't stay. <laughs> right? So what are you after, preacher? I'm just, I'm trying to, I, I, all I want to communicate is, is that God has such a life yeah. in front of you and I. And you say, well, yeah, but, you know, you're whatever your age is, and this should be something that, that our young people should hear. Yes, it is. And so often we're not communicating that to the generations after us. We're just trying to get them to do the bare minimum. And, and, and what we do is we communicate the gospel in a way that says, okay, what's the least i got to do to not go to hell? And so we want to check the box. Well, listen, I'm not for going to hell. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But let me tell you something. There is more to this. It's a better life. There's a better way. It's a new and living way. He came because he brought us a better promise. And he established a better covenant. It's not about your performance. It's about his performance. It's about what he did to secure our victory. And now he and if we died with him on Calvary. And we were quickened with him in the grave. And we were raised up with him in his resurrection. And we are seated with him in heavenly places. He has has taken us from judgment unto victory and placed us in the winner's circle. I'm telling you, I'm about to get happy. Praise the Lord. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Hallelujah. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Because I'm getting a lot of mileage out of that last scripture and then we're done, right? Because when we read about the promised land, we think it's about a piece of real estate in Israel. We think it's about a piece of real estate over in the Middle East. And then when you read the book of Hebrews, excuse me, when you read the book of Hebrews, you discover that it was about rest. It's about a life that gives you rest. Hallelujah. And he goes on to say of Joshua, or literally of King James, it says Jesus, but it's, but it's directly pointing to Joshua, and his and Jesus' name were the same in Hebrew. So it's just a, they just translated it as Jesus and not Joshua. And we differentiate that, which I, I, on a personal level I find amusing. I, you know, I mean, unless you're from somewhere else, you know, there's not very many people in the U.S. that will name their kid Jesus, but we will name him Joshua, right? And I, 
I smile to myself when I hear that because it's the same name. Anyway, there I got distracted being cute, huh? And I don't do cute very well. <laughs> you can tell that by looking at me. Anyway, show you how to take a real rest. And what he said was, if, for, if they, if, for if Joshua, and literally if Jesus, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 4. Read those in your time when you get a chance. And so what he does, what he said is, is that God was talking about something else. He wasn't just talking about a place. He wasn't just talking about prime real estate in the, in the Middle East. He was talking about a people who learn how and who find their way to live in, at rest. Hallelujah. At peace. In, the, in a place of blessing, in a place of, of shalom, which is, a, which, is a, which is a peace that is prosperous, bountiful, and benevolent. It is a, a sense of fullness. It's a sense of satisfaction. When you say shalom, you're not just saying peace. In other words, I hope you're not nervous about anything. That's not, you, you know, I mean, that's not exactly what you're saying. What you're saying is, is I hope that you are so full and so satisfied in your life and in this day that you have that you have nothing incumbent upon you to make you want more than you already have. Yeah. Yeah. That rest yeah. was not met when they conquered the land in the book of Joshua and throughout the time of Judges. Come with me. You get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Go ahead. Walk with me. Walk with me. And work with me. So, well, Pastor, you just said it's grace, not about works. No, works not your, your performance is not going to enhance you. It's not going to make you acceptable before God, but you're going to have an opportunity to agree with and come into contact context of his life and his work and put your neck in that yoke and pull with him. I guarantee you he'll do all the heavy lifting. I guarantee you that, that if you trust him, he will, he, will, he will be there to allow your life and my life to be to not get overwhelmed with all of the weight of things that is that it, that might be associated with your with your vocation. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Hallelujah. Look at look at the, the life of Jesus is, is an instructional life. It's not just a, a, a life to explore and look at to find. Uh, just, uh, you know, it, it should inspire worship. Now let me make sure I get that said right. But, but it shouldn't inspire separation. It should inspire us to be like him. It should draw us into a place where we can, we can pursue and press toward what he, what he is, his image, his likeness, his relationship. Because he's, he showed us the Father, but he also showed us what sonship looks like. There's so much to this today. I apologize for not getting it all said, but I've been at it a while. I know you're getting tired. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Just because you have, just because he says walk with me and work with me, doesn't mean that you're going to be overwhelmed and that you're going to be exhausted and weary. You're going to do it from a place of rest. You're going to do it from, with an unforced rhythm. And a sense of peace and a sense of grace in what you do and how you do it. And it is going to empower you to continue to walk with him and work with him. Because you realize that you don't have it all to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That to me is the walk of paradise. That to me. What he's talking about here is he said, come on. Learn his father something. There's so many elements that kind of filter in and feed into this to kind of fill this out to where it says you and I are in a really good place. My grandmother used to say you're in the catbird seat. And she meant that you were in the most advantageous position. I don't know why that saying evolved like it did. I can't speak to that. It just meant you were in a really good place, a prime location, and she called it the catbird seat. So I'm going to try to do my best to keep that little tidbit alive, okay? So he came to put you and I in the catbird seat, okay? <laughs> 
Praise the Lord. Now, you know, the unforced rhythms of grace, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Do I have one more? Yes. I think I do. Keep company with me. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Hallelujah. Is that not precious? I mean, what a exceedingly great and precious promise he offers us here. A relationship of life and peace. A, a lifestyle that is that is replete or full of joy and gladness, blessing, and favor. And you say, but, but Pastor, there are things that happen. I understand that. I'm not he, ne he never says nothing bad will ever happen to you, right? He does in John 14 say, in the world you'll have tribulations, but he also says what? Be good cheer. Yeah. Right? So often we want to revel in how bad the world is and how terrible everything is, and we want to focus on all of that. But as a believer, I'm going to tell you, don't do that. And I'm not saying you can't admit things are off out there. You can't. It's not that you can't admit that things are not as they should be. I, I get that, and I, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand that. And you can, you can sit around and you can, you can focus on those things. But what, you, what you and I need to do is be of good cheer, because He's overcome the world, and He didn't do it to fail. Hallelujah. And you and I are part and parcel. Let's keep walking with him and working with him and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And we'll learn how to navigate this. We'll live freely and we'll live lightly by, him, by being yoked together with him and we'll find our way forward. If you're feeling overwhelmed by all that's in front of you to do, then you need to get, uh, lean into the yoke of Christ and find your way to allow the, the, the weight of that to settle on your shoulders and on your neck so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all that's in front of you, you have a co-labor. You have a, you have a, a companion and keep, you're keeping company with one who will carry the day, who has all strength, who has all power, who has all wisdom. Hallelujah. And you find a place of rest in all that he is. Praise the Lord. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, my rendition of the Paradise Walk. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you today. And right now, Lord, as we stand in in your presence. Hallelujah. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you've been overwhelmed, if, you've, if you're feeling the pressure, if you're in a position where you feel like you just, you're apprehensive or nervous or full of anxiety about what's to come and what's out there, then and let's, uh, we'll pray with you today. If you want to respond to that in the name of Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity. We will stand here. We will pray with you and, 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 and entreat the, uh, the, the Lord and invoke the, the word of the Lord today. So we'll give you just a few minutes. If, you, if that's part and parcel of where you are, then, then come. Come to Jesus and find that. Come to Jesus and receive that mercy. Come to him and let his yoke take you and be the primary bearer of your burden. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's some folks coming. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I bless you and I thank you. Come on up, baby. Anybody else wants to come and pray with me, pray with them, please do that. Praise the Lord. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor and we give you blessing. Father, for these that have reached out to you, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Father, they say yes to your purpose. They say yes to your rest. Father God, they receive now with meekness, with gladness and meekness, the engrafted word, hallelujah, Father, that will show them the way freely and lightly, Father God. Lord, let them know that you do the heavy lift and you have, you have made a way where there has been no way. 
that Lord God, hallelujah, you have you have brought strength and grace into their lives and Father, peace beyond certain certain things. And I just, Father, I just ask you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, to let rest. Hallelujah. Just here, I just hear particularly Miss Bunny for rest, for all that's been all that's been up torn up and, and, and in upheaval in your in your family and in your circumstance. I just hear, I just say, we speak rest into your life. We speak peace into your mind. Uh, and right now you come and, and he said he would, he made a promise and we received that promise out of Matthew 11 for you today. And Father, so just, just thank him for what he's doing in your life. And Miss Joyce, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that, that, that the strength that you need, you've been looking for strength into your body Hallelujah, and into your even into your legs, even down into your back and legs. I know that I, I've known for for a while you've had back issues, but this is even down into your legs. There's been a real weakness and a real buckling in the knees, and I just speak strength and life into your body right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Father, let healing flow. Father, God, let your anointing do what, what man cannot do in this moment, in this hour. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Father. Bless you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And God good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we'll be encouraged today. I pray your encouragement. Hallelujah, we'll just find you and settle upon you. In Jesus' name, Miss Debbie, come on.